Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 197. How is Python being used to automate processes in the laboratory? How can it speed up scientific work with DNA sequencing? This week on the show, chemical engineering PhD student Parza Kadarmazi is here to discuss Python and bioinformatics. Parsa provides background on his research and the bioinformatic techniques used to discover gut microbes' role in human health and diseases. We talk about automating lab experiments with liquid-handling robots in Python. We dig into libraries to shatter and reassemble DNA sequences. Parsa also shares current projects from the Chan Lab at Colorado State University and his GitHub repository. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Parza, welcome to the show. Hi, Christopher. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, I, I'm really excited to talk to you. You reached out and had a, a bunch of interesting things that you wanted to talk about. And a lot of them have to do with real world applications of Python in the laboratory and experiments. So maybe you could give me a little background on where you're at. You're, you're currently in your PhD program and maybe you could explain a little bit about what you're currently doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now I'm in my PhD program, fifth year at Colorado State University, and I'm in chemical and biological engineering department. So my background, I, I'm coming from an engineering background, and, and honestly, for my undergraduate studies, I never did any biology, and, and in, my, in my doctoral studies, I got interested in biological systems. And, and somehow, they're very similar to systems that we study right now. They are Maybe more complex, but the concepts behind them are very similar to classical chemical engineering, like factories. Uh, we actually treat the cells like factories, and the, the analogy goes beyond that. Even like we have, for example, piping systems. They have some sort of analogs in in the cellular and biological space. Okay. So I find I find this system really interesting, and a lot of programming is also also involved in this process. I think that's really cool that you kind of almost sort of shifted direction into your PhD program. That That's pretty cool. Yeah. Were you doing any programming before that in your other, was it an engineering course then before that? Yes. Yeah, so so mainly we were using MATLAB okay. for anything. And it was mostly computer simulations. And okay. the fun part is that we, in my first year in the PhD, everything was in MATLAB, but maybe over a year Everything in our lab just shifted to Python, okay. <laughs> because we 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 soon realized that that it's the, the Python offers. The one thing is the package; like there are so many good packages that we can use in Python, and also how easy it is for someone to get started with Python and become better soon. So that's why we shifted to Python. I think uh, after the first year, and we have been using Python for maybe four years and uh, something like that yeah 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 i would imagine that a lot of the tooling i don't know these last four years have been extremely productive <laughs> <laughs> as far as uh you know the scientific community and and the adoption of python there i'm mean, not saying that wasn't before that but I, I feel like uh the tooling has gotten easier and like you said there's a, the ability to kind of build on top of other people's work as opposed to having to build everything from scratch has that been your experience yes and and one funny thing i'm coming back from a seminar today and and these seminars happen like weekly and it's been four weeks in a row that everybody's saying we were using matlab and suddenly we shifted to Python. It seems like <laughs> it's something that's really happening yeah. at a more speed recently. But yeah. Yeah, I, that's interesting because I, I think a lot of universities, I mean, it depends on the professor's background and, and the tooling that they've been using and maybe the funding. 
MATLAB is a thing where it's, you know, they have to be purchased, right? Seats for it and things like that. So I, I think that might be a, an attractive thing for a university too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I know that some of the programs are thinking about replacing this entirely. So one issue is that the courses are based on MATLAB and already yeah. there's a lot of syllabus development and you need to like prepare new materials. And that's why maybe in the education part, we still have, MATLAB taught, but I think that will also change. Like even the freshman and undergraduate students will be trained on Python uh, instead of math. That's uh, that's just my guess. Yeah, and that's the pattern that I'm seeing right now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So one of the areas that you said that you wanted to speak about when mm -hmm. you sent me the email was you wanted to talk about using Python in the lab. Yeah. And then how Python's being used in the field of bioinformatics. And I immediately had to go online and go, <laughs> all right, what is bioinformatics? So I, I don't know if you're comfortable. Could you explain to the audience, like, you know, generally what is bioinformatics? Yeah, sure. I think it's a very general term. And and the way I use it is, is just like procedures to process biological data, the data that relates to biological systems. Okay. This could go even to like hospitals and, and it could be as broad as that, like data from hospitals could, could be in this realm as well. But what I am working on is specifically data from microbial systems. So okay. these cells are living organisms and we kind of get information, different type of information. The way we process that, the science that is behind processing this information into useful information that could be used for next step actions, all of that falls into bioinformatics for me. Okay. Yeah. So it could be, um, you mentioned later, like working with sequences of DNA or it might be looking at the information that you're doing through repeated studies, just sort of managing the information about, if you will, the biology field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because DNA sequences are really uh, like, it's a, amount of data is being generated uh, that, that are DNA sequences. And it goes from how, how do we store these data? How, how do we use databases? How do we, like different uh, algorithms, how, to, how we can actually process these information into useful outputs? All of that requires computer knowledge from software engineering algorithms. And, and it goes even beyond these topics. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of data to manage. Yeah. I, it's kind of one of these like areas you always hear of the world, uh, world of big data. And you think of like banks and financial data and lots of documentation and so forth. But you're dealing with just raw, <laughs> huge amounts of data looking at, like you said, the genomes and things like that, which yeah. is pretty, pretty intense amount of data. So a couple of things that we wanted to dig into based upon our back and forth through email was to kind of think about like what are the different places where Python fits into your role as a researcher. And I thought one of the cool ones was this idea of how Python has helped you in the lab itself and doing your experiments. You sent me a video uh, about uh, how you would manually dilute a, a bacterial sample was the example they gave there and how it was like, okay, the beginning of the day, wipe down this surface. Okay, start here. And it was just like so much manual stuff. And then like literally the next day, you were only like maybe five steps into the process. It was kind of wild. And so you sent me a link to a company, uh, Opentrons, this manufacturer who was uh, creating a liquid handling robot. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and then how Python intersects with that as far as uh, helping you in the lab? Yeah, sure. So as a researcher, my work splits into two parts. One is the wet lab projects, which we actually go to the lab and plan and do experiments in the lab. And the other part is more like computational work, where we develop algorithms, do data analysis, and that kind of stuff. So yeah. that robot is really <laughs> something that has changed the way we do experiments and it falls into the wet lab part. So we used to do things by hand, like uh, hand pipettes. And and it becomes really hard because in, in many of the experiments that we do, it's just you have to go manually. And, and some of these 
place that we work with, they have like 96 very similar wells that you need to pipe it fr- something <laughs> from one of them and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and drop it into the other one. And it becomes really confusing and, and error prone, I guess, maybe. Uh, yeah, very, very error prone and also like tedious because you have to do yeah. something repetitious and, and, and it's not. And it's just like, if, if that part could be automated, it saves a lot of time and, uh, and probably a lot of error and, 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 and in the long term, maybe money for the lab. And, and for this reason, we use these machines in the lab to automate the process. Do you know, like, the age of the use of those types of machines in the lab? Is it uh, a uh, recent it, development? Uh, in our lab or in general? Yeah, maybe your lab or just generally. So we started about, I think, five years ago uh, in the lab okay. with with these robots. But uh, and I think at that point this company was very new, so things were already at the second generation. But we were one of the first labs on our campus to use such robotics. So I think it wasn't that common, even if it was like the the company existed before it wasn't that common but after some time right now i know at least four labs in our department that use such robotics so i think like people are moving towards that point yeah yeah so actually the fun fact is for uh, we we used to perform a lot of covid tests on campus during the covid years oh okay and because because that the numbers were huge. What campus that they use these machines to speed up the process and make the the testing part really fast, so so we could get back our results from from our tests very soon, and they they could soon isolate potential people with the virus. They they could say that soon and potentially avoid spreading it. So this is one of the places that it was used. Yeah, nice. So how is Python used in there? I was able to go to the site. I don't know if the is the company OpenTrons? Is that the yes. name? Or yeah, okay, yeah. And um, so I kind of dug into a little bit and found the Python mm-hmm. protocol API and started yes. looking at it. Um, what where where does it fit in? What what are the controls that it's uh, allowing you to do with Python? So, so right now you can go to the website, build a protocol just just using the graphical user interface and without any knowledge of Python. But what goes on behind the scene is a Python code is generated and it's given to a computer that is inside the robot, which is a Raspberry Pi, I think. Hmm. And then the, this code gets executed and it gets transformed into robot actions like go up this much and, and pick up that much liquid from uh, from this coordinate and move it to that coordinate. So as I said, right now, there's a great graphical user interface that they provided. But for more advanced protocols, we usually have to write the protocol ourselves. So it okay. would become a Python script that you have to write. And, you know, for, for that example that I said, like you have wells that are, mm, let's say you have 96 well plates that are like 12 different columns and you have to do repetitious things. These concepts fit really nicely with something like loops and in, in programming. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of doing it uh, yourself, just, just uh, a, a simple for loop can do that and avoid possible uh, mistakes. And one other interesting programming concept that comes here are the exceptions and, and errors. Oh, okay. So it can run a simulation of the experiment, that, uh, the protocol that you give it, and, and it raises uh, exceptions based on if there is some sort of logical issues in your code. For example, this well has 200 milliliter liquid in it, but if you're pipe, uh, sorry, microliter in it, but if you're pipetting more than that, then that doesn't mean anything because there's not that much liquid in that well. So yeah, okay. So it's, it's really good to know these upfront because if you were doing those by hand in a, in a lab notebook, you might not no, notice some of the miscalculations that you might have for your experiment, which is a really great. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of uh, pre-checking your work uh, before you run it. It's like a like a running a almost like a test run. Yeah, pass on it. Yeah, you might do like a pie test or something like that on it. Yes, yeah. So it sounds like there are some stock tools that are built into the graphical user interface. Are you able to take what one of those would generate as like a script and just modify the existing script and add the the additional kind of controls you want or the exceptions you're mentioning? Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. Finally, I think it it just gives you a .py file. 
okay. the interface. So if you don't want to change it, just import it in the in the desktop computer and and which is connected to the robot. Finally, that Python code gets interpreted. And if you go to that Python, you can make any change that you want. But again, before running anything, even if you change that code, before running it, it will run a test to make sure that nothing is going on uh, and is bad with the protocol. Nice. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like its own simulation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah. When you're developing the code for that, you, you kind of mentioned the word script a couple times. What is your personal development? environment look look like are you using like a like a laptop and working with a particular code editor what are the types of tools that you use in the lab for python coding there so you can both use something like any text editor okay but you also can use jupyter which is something that i haven't used and my advisor always uses and for other projects i haven't used jupyter but the good thing about jupyter is that you can run warp one part of your experiment and then stop and then run the next instead of like running the whole experiment at once that that's one nice thing that jupyter notebooks gives you i always personally work in vs code okay and and that's my preferred editor that i go to but and i, I also i always when i use jupyter notebook i use the jupyter extension inside vs code yeah yeah has that flexibility. Uh, yeah, it's a really nice thing to have. Are there other techniques that are involved with using these liquid handling robots? So technique, what, like, what? I'm trying to think of, like, are there other, we talked about it can be used for like, these dilution mm -hmm. experiments and things like that. Are there other types of experiments that they are well-suited for, it, for what you're doing currently? Yes. Well, I've seen people doing really interesting type of experiments with it. For example, there, there are type of experiments. We want to pick a colony of microbes and, and inoculate something like a, another tube with that specific colony. So really, you need to be very precise. For example, you have to pick that colony very precisely if you're doing it by hand. Okay. But I've seen people that using a camera that is that exists on top of this, this robot, it could actually use some image analysis to go to that place and pick that colony and then and then drop it into a destination world, which is really fascinating, something like because wow. it's really accurate. <laughs> I, I, I see a lot of applications for this. Yeah. What, why I'm laughing is I was I did watch that video on uh, serial <laughs> dilu dilution, mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, you know, not only the hand-eye coordination that you were mentioning before of like all these different, you know, experiments going and pipetting things and so forth but there's a second phase where you're like you know getting the pt dishes out and you know not only like labeling everything but then having to like spread stuff in these like three little areas around the mm -hmm. thing and i'm like oh my god that would be so like not only tedious but like difficult to do because you're like supposed to like only take a certain amount to this other area <laughs> and so i could see how like maybe computer vision and this robot could maybe do that kind of thing where it's laying it out inside of a petri dish. Is that something it does too? Because we talked about the dilution, but I don't know if it, it does the plating also. Yeah, so I think these uh, things are, they don't come by default. It's just the creativity of the users because... Ah, okay, yeah. Because this is Python going on it in the back end and, and you have access to all these really cool image analysis libraries and and finally everything gets converted to protocol so so i think uh that's why uh so many people can be creative and create really cool things with the robot but finally what happens inside that code is that you tell the robot to go to a specific destination and that could be hacked to go to a destination and do something that we want out of it that maybe it wasn't designed to do that but but it could be cool in a, in a lab setting sure yeah so kind of moving beyond that and kind of s switching gears into, okay, now you've run these experiments and you've got your results. Now you're looking at doing these techniques for, you know, these bioinformatic techniques and you're like, okay, I want to sequence data. There's a couple of things that you were talking about, a couple of different experiments that you were running, like you were doing some stuff kind of looking at the role of gut microbes and human health. You want to talk a little bit about I don't know what to call it, a project, or I don't know what to call it, a study. Like, um, I don't have, I have the terminology in my head, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so actually, we can start with the robot, how that happens. So we have these tiny microbes in our gut that 
that helps us stay healthy. They uh, extract a lot of nutrition from the, the food that we eat. And they finally, they circulate back to our bloodstream. So yeah. when something happens to this community of micro, and this community of micro is, is a very complex combination of different microbes, microbes from different taxonomic branches. And what happens is that when you take a sample from the gut environment, it's just not, you're not left with one single organism. You have thousands of different species. So, so it becomes a really hard problem how we can understand what they're doing. So the goal of that dilution to ex uh, extinction experiment is that to break down that community by dilution. So every time that you dilute, you leave something out from the previous community and, and introduce it a more simplified um, sub-community into the new one and then again dilute until you reach to a point where you have two or three different microorganism that you can actually work with you can you can understand them better and that's the whole point of doing serial dilution experiments okay and from that point we can for example see compare all the the communities that have two or three microbes and see for example this one produces more of that compound and that compound is good for health so how we can improve the whole community is by making the environment more suitable for the ones that made that specific compound that we are after. Okay. So finally, for example, there are many diseases that are linked to specific type of dysbiosis in the or imbalance in the gut microbiome community. And, and by comparing samples from these patients to those healthy individuals, we can see which microbes are different or the ones that are different, what they are doing differently and using this for threat therapeutic application. So, so yes, we, we isolate all these simplified communities. And then what we do is usually we either measure the chemicals that are produced by these organisms or sequence the DNA. And through that DNA sequencing and the bioinformatics technique, we can say this Organisms probably did this, and and that's why we can maybe maybe use it as a probiotic, or if it uh, has a bad effect, just remove it. Do something that that it cannot grow so fast that it's doing in the unhealthy patients. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. You talked about the dilution getting down to like maybe only seeing two or three things uh, in a sample, as opposed to like the whole wide gamut of everything that's there. Yeah. And then you talked about measuring compounds that are that are there, or I guess proteins or yeah. what have you. Like, yeah. what are the tools that are used there? I'm sorry if I'm kind of going really basic mm. here, but no, no, no. <laughs> what techniques do you use to uh, look at that? So there are two techniques that we use, but there are other ones. So gas chromatography and liquid chromatography are two common techniques that is used, and mainly when you take blood samples outside, they use similar instruments. To measure different, so that they, what they finally do is they give a approximate concentration of each of those components that are identified in the samples. So th those are the two. NMR is another one that is common, but we don't use. But these two are really common because once you have the instrument, instrument itself is not cheap. But once you have the instrument, it could be cheap to run a sample and see what you have like what components are in your in your samples and and those are the things that we use on a daily basis to kind of break it down to how that information is pulled out and turned into data are you inserting that small sample into like a machine and it's doing the measurement and then it's outputting like a data file for you yeah exactly but the, well, the, the only thing that you need to do before, uh, you have to do some sort of preparations. For example, if sure. you have to filter the microbes out, for example, because, because those microbes are larger particles and they could interfere with the machine. So first you do something like a centrifuge to keep the bacteria and, and larger particles out. And then when you have like a very, maybe a well-behaved liquid, uh, I don't know, uh, for, 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 <laughs> sure. for lack of a better word. But when you have that, you can run it. When you give it to the machine, it, it will output some sort of diagrams. And these diagrams, based on the peak intensity and, and where that diagram happens, because it's like a spectrum, it's like those earthquake type of graphs. I don't know if you've seen them. They have, they're, they're very noisy. and Sure. We have the same thing here, but depending on where that peak is happening and how big that peak is. So where that peak is happening in the chromatogram, is the, call, the name of that graph, 
in the chromatogram where that peak is happening is telling you what component it is and how intense that peak is. It's telling you how much of that component is there. Okay. Just to do a quick analogy on that specific thing, uh, as a person who's into photography, there's a setting that you can use called a histogram mm. that looks at the overall light of the image. And so it shows, you know, peaks and valleys showing like, okay, this part of the image had this much light yeah. and was clipping or was, you know, like too too bright and it's all white or this was too dark or whatever. So I'm guessing that chromatogram is a, a similar thing and you're able to see the different levels of components there. Yes, exactly. Very similar. Uh, except that in, in pictures, you only have like intensity and, and light is always the same. But here, different components reach the, that receptor at, that is at the end of the machine. And, and each peak is for a different component. That's the only different. Yeah. 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 Okay. Those graphs that you get out of there then can be uh, turned into the sort of the raw data that you're going to use for the next step. Yes. The, usually the machine comes with a software that, that, get, that turns those into tabular data. For example, you can say, this is the concentration of component A, this is the concentration of component B, and so on. And it gives you like a spreadsheet that, that has that information in it. And then that's something where we can take that information and use it in statistical analysis to compare the samples. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's titled Building Python Project Documentation with MK Docs. The course is based on a real Python step-by-step -step project by frequent guest Martin Broyce. And in the video course, instructor Darren Jones shows you how to work with MK Docs to produce static pages from Markdown, pull in code documentation from doc strings using MK Doc strings, follow best practices for project documentation, and use the material for MK Docs theme to make your documentation look great, and how to host your documentation on GitHub pages. I think using tools like this can make what seems like a daunting task so much easier. And I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how to automate production of your project's documentation. Your users will truly appreciate it. RealPython video courses are broken into easily consumable sections and where needed, include code examples for the technique shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. And so is that machine connected in a way that the data, I know I'm being really microscopic in my, <laughs> my uh, analysis of how we're talking about this stuff, but like, is it coming out as a CSV file or is it, how are you getting that yeah, tabular data? Usually I think it's an uh, Excel format. Like, okay. Usually it's like that. And you can just save that Excel file finally into a CSV. One thing is, so for researchers, maybe Excel might be a more familiar term than, than a CSV. Sometimes that's the case. Sure. Uh, and Excel is a pretty common tool to use. And sometimes you don't even need to get out of Excel to do everything that is related to your research. But when you scale things up, that's where Python becomes maybe more efficient in, in doing the data analysis. Yeah, yeah. I recently had some of the people working on the Python in Excel on the show. And mm -hmm. it was very interesting to talk to them. And it's interesting to hear that because that sounds like that might be yet another way to, again, maybe avoid having to hop through multiple layers to get somewhere. Yes. Uh, at least to do the initial analytic research and kind of looking at what, what you have to, to make sure, like, okay, this is worthwhile. We're going to take this to the next step. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that sounds uh, really exciting. I, I haven't had a chance to try that out yet, but it looks very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's still kind of in a beta phase mm -hmm. where you have to be part yeah. of their sort of developer 365 mm -hmm. program and have to sign up for things and okay. and so forth. And I, I think it's only on Windows. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by it. it. It's very interesting to see what, what yeah. they're going to do with it. And it's there's a lot of stuff in it. They preload a lot of data science stuff ready to go in it. So, <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the DNA sequencing technologies, or did we cover most of the things you wanted to cover on this first section? Yes, and I think this is a good point because we have our samples now and, and we have sequenced it, but why do we do sequencing is because we can kind of, the idea is we can infer all the biological information from DNA because we think that DNA is the blueprint 
to living organisms, every kind of information that is required for a biological function is encoded in DNA. So the assumption is if we can sequence DNA and understand that sequence, we can say a lot of things about the biology that is going on uh, in the samples that we got those information from. So what happens is that using different techniques, we remove different components that we don't need. And somehow we want to purify that DNA that is inside a sample in a process called DNA extraction. So we don't want to have different components that we don't need for the DNA analysis and they could interfere with the process. So we just try to using chemical treatment, just take those components out. Okay. When we do DNA extraction, finally, we have our DNA and this DNA can be sequenced in different facilities. And finally, what you get out of these sequencing machines is is just a bunch of A, T, C, G letters that, that are really large, like surprisingly large. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, not surprisingly, because if, if we assume that everything is happening using the information inside this DNA, it won't be yeah, yeah. that surprising. But 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 it's uh, those files could be large, even for very small and uh, cell that have simpler DNA than other ones. Can you give a like a size that would be comparable on like computer terms? Like, is that yeah, sure, gigabytes uh, or you know something larger? So it depends. It depends on in the microbial world, we are usually are bound to ten megabytes on the high end, and on the low end, we we are okay. Usually, it's half a megabyte. I would say okay. A gene, and like the entire DNA for us, uh, for one cell would be around that. But for human cells, in, is in the gigabyte. And like everything changes in between. For example, you have some sort of maybe more complex micro, like yeast will have bigger and more complex DNA. The yeast that we use for in, in the bakeries or in the breweries for making beer, those are slightly more complex okay. than bacterial cells. And they should be. Not still in the gigabytes, but definitely larger than bacterial cells. Yeah, one of the techniques you talked about is this idea of, I think it was, was it called shattering? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. To break apart the DNA to focus on like the very specific sequence. Because uh, I'm guessing in the types of things you study, like if you're looking at bacteria, there's probably a, a huge, well, a large amount of repetition that all of them have this sort of structural stuff and then you want to focus on certain areas? Am I getting that part right? Well, the, the reason for shattering DNA uh, is not to focus on a specific part. It's just because the se- sequencing facilities can cannot sequence DNAs that are longer than a specific length. They have this limitation. Okay. They work based on optical signals. And if they continue to longer pieces of DNA, they find the error becomes so high that the data is basically not useful okay so what what we have to do is before that using mechanical forces we have to break down the dna big dna molecules into smaller pieces and uh, like 300 we call it base pairs by 300 i mean 300 a t c g letters something like that. that's the usual okay and then we can sequence those smaller pieces but now that we have solved one problem we have created many more because <laughs> <laughs> okay. The problem becomes then how do you know the how to fit these pieces together? It becomes a big puzzle and and the way it happens is based on the overlaps that these sequences might have there are different algorithms called assembly algorithms that they they make a sort of graph that that connects these sequences based on the the overlap between these sequences and then finally finding the longest path that you can find between these pieces in the graph that will kind of resolve that piece of DNA in that region. And it's a really open-ended problem and a very complex algorithm that that these tools achieve. And these, because of the performance considerations, they are usually not implemented in Python, usually in, in other languages like C, C++. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and, and then, uh, but they usually have an interface in Python. So finally, for example, the CLI is in, is in Python. Uh, that connects okay. to different modules that are written in other languages. Yeah, you provided a bunch of links to these libraries. Yes. Is the 
the one I, I think it's called Mega Hit. Is that kind of in this realm that we're talking about? Okay. Yes, it's a tool that I use, and it's designed to get those what we call short reads, and it's it's an assembler, so it assembles those short reads into longer pieces. And the goal here is to recreate those pieces that we shatter. The reason is if we have small pieces. We don't have that much statistical significance to say things for sure. For example, if it's too small, it could, it could be happening by just chance, by random. Uh, however, if we make it really long, then then if there is a very similar match to this long piece in the in a database that we have, we can say things more certainly. Okay. Yeah. This is now significant or what have you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You shared that project with me, which. I think it's kind of interesting because it says here like a copyright of 2015, the University of Hong Kong, their kind of initial license of it up here on, on GitHub. I find that fascinating. Is is that common in universities that across these different communities that there are sharing their code? Is that like a pretty common thing that you've found within this field? Yes, especially in bioinformatics. One thing that I'm really grateful for is that being open source is kind of the theme. When you publish a paper or wherever you mention your package name or wherever you want to present on things, usually you provide that in an open source, like as a GitHub repository and places like that, that everybody can use. And and it's really a common theme, as I said, Good. in this field. So, so yes, I think, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So one of the other projects you mentioned is looking at the prediction of anaerobic digestion metabolism. Yes. Um, and that one is, I think it's called AD Toolbox. Do you want to talk about that project? Yes. So the other packages that you mentioned, those are by other labs, but we are starting to write our own packages and publish them. So sometimes these packages stay on, uh, like they call different tools that exist in other languages or from other projects. So AD Toolbox is a project that, that we started for modeling the anaerobic digestion system. Anaerobic digestion system is just to explain that quickly is a, is a system that has been used traditionally for making use of waste, especially organic waste, something like foods from cafeteria, restaurants. These all go to waste. And if we don't do something about them, they get converted to methane, which goes to atmosphere. We lose a lot of energy and also the, it's a greenhouse gas, so it has a really high global warming potential. So so the goal of this project is to somehow manage that anaerobic digestion process to, to break down these waste components into useful products. And, and this is happening by microbes. So the, the type of microbes that exist in this environment matter. For example, if you put more of those microbes that, that are more useful for the process to produce the product that we are after, there's a good chance that we improve the efficiency of this process. So, so since this is a microbial process, we need to take into account the information that is coming from the DNA of those microbes. And this is the goal of this tool. For example, it, it takes the DNA information, uh, processes them, and finally it feeds them to a mathematical model and in future a machine learning model to predict the, the behavior of this anaerobic digestion system, what you can do to improve them and applications like this. So this is a project that other members of your doctoral program are, are working on together? This is mainly uh, led by me, and, and we have some undergraduate students that are trained on Python, and finally they contribute to this project. So, okay. So, yes. Nice. It's a, like a cool library. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the other libraries that you're able to leverage to do the work inside of this package? So, most of the things that I use to do, so for example, it has different modules. So at one point where we use the DNA sequences, we use packages outside of Python. There's this really cool sequence alignment tool that matches a sequence of DNA into a known database. It's called MMSeqs. Okay. This is a very, very cool <laughs> uh, tool that is written in, 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 I think, in C++, and it's really fast for that kind of... So, so this code actually calls that, that MMSeqs and then collects the information. We use pandas for any kind of data manipulation, for example, getting the, the alignment results and using that information to draw any sort of conclusions. And then finally, we this is connected to a Dash app, like Dash in the 
Plotly world. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it finally creates that Dash application that, that shows the simulation results. And this is an interactive web page. So, for example, different parameters could be changed. What happens if we increase the temperature? What is the effect of increasing temperature on methane production? So when you change that parameter of temperature, it will change the results and it will show the results like it updates the web page, basically. Yeah, I found Dash to be a very good complement to this project. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of uh, visualizations, and that's a great project because it yeah. includes so much of the the underlying work that you can kind of again host it and get it posted there. I'm wondering a little bit about the data that is involved there. Are you using you know what kind of database? Where is all this data stored that you're you're accessing and and running through this system? Yes, so. As I said, it, it has different modules for each module. It could be different. Okay. Most of the the databases that we talk about here in this project, they're usually small. We intentionally kept them small okay. to be fast because since we are only focusing on anaerobic digestion, we may be we may not need all the information from different ecosystems. And because of that, we are just using a flat file, which is it's a common format called FASTA in bioinformatics, which is a fancy text file, again, in the key value format. So you have a key and then you have a value. So your keys are just a line that starts with a specific character, like a caret sign. And then your sequence starts right below that line. Again, so the key will be that line that starts with the caret and whatever comes underneath will be the information. And that's how we store these data. Okay. You have a <laughs> you have another project that you have you say that's still under heavy development and will become public soon. Is that the AD toolbox or is that uh, the next one, the spam DFBBA? No, no, the AD toolbox is still something that we are working on. Especially these days, uh, we want it will be out very soon. I think in a matter of weeks. Okay. But my next project is completely published and it's on GitHub. And there's a tried our best to have a good documentation website for it. Cool. Available. Yes. So the next one. What's that project do? So that project is more like a AI project. Okay. So one thing is when you have these pieces of DNA, you have some information, but the problem is you still cannot predict the behavior of cells because even given that information, there are so many different ways that microbes can behave given their DNA. For example, if you consider complex piping system, which valves they should turn, that information is not in the DNA. So, well, I mean, at, at least it's not easy to extract those information. So how microbes regulate their behavior is something that is a really an open problem in, in this field. Mm, okay. And this tool is something that tries a technique uh, called reinforcement learning, where all different trajectories for behavior of a microbe is tried. And then based on trial and error, these microbes try to improve their behaviors. And the reason that we think that this will work is because, well, microbes evolve really fast in the lab. Like you can see the microbes evolve in a few generations. Okay. So what happens is the microbes just evolve, they adapt their strategies and maybe something that we are all familiar with is different, for example, strains of the COVID virus. You see that, that at some point, some strains comes out that acts a little different, maybe more contagious. It's just because they're rapidly changing and that change gets reflected. I mean, microbes are more complex and so just the problem becomes more complicated. But this tool is basically some artificial intelligence technique to find how the behavior of these microbes will converge to a specific point that is determined by the evolution of that organism. And here we use a lot of like neural network packages like PyTorch and and also the Ray library for parallelization. Okay. Drilling into like things like the hardware and how you're running these things. I've mentioned time to time on the show that I've tried to run projects that I want to feature on the show to kind of showcase them. Say, oh, this seems like a really cool project and it might use something like PyTorch or use some other big library like that. And I have a hard time getting them set up very often. And so I, I I feel like it works best sometimes to like, you know, have it as a container or some other kind of environment. So I'm wondering like, how are you running those types of, of experiments and what type of machine is it running on? So for this one, 
for some of the test cases, depends on the test case, how complex and hard it is to to make those simulations. If it's for the test cases that I have on the, the documentation website, it's you can run it on a simple, I have a Mac M1 machine, which is great. And it, it suffices for those kind of applications. But for bigger projects, we moved to a supercomputer that we have in Colorado that is shared between the universities here. It's called Alpine. Okay. It's shared between CSU and Colorado University at Boulder. And I think one more, which I don't recall right now. These are, sometimes you can really get big resources from, from this supercomputer. And, and for example, for our assembly, what we do is, I, I usually request for two terabytes of random access memory, which is really high and could not be done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not, not on my machine. So, and then, then what you do there is it's a Linux system. You create your virtual environment, install the packages that you want. And then VS Code, for me, I, I use this approach that VS Code connects to a remote server and, and I just type in the code that I want and you can debug that in a remote server and finally when it's ready i just run the project on on the cluster and get the results back and and do the simpler data analysis on my own personal computer that's cool yeah Yeah. i always wonder about that having these resources that are again university scale which is kind of fun so that one i'll include links for all of these different projects you you mentioned a couple times about the documentation of that particular project were there tools that you were using to help you document that? Uh, yes, I used MK Docs for building the documentation website and tried to have the, for example, doc test and also yeah, yeah, all the doc strings for every function and class in, in the in the script to be as clear as possible. And and yeah, I, I love MK Docs. I think it it makes the whole documentation a lot more easy and also final products looks really good so yeah 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 we uh have a couple courses that touch on that and i think it's a nice way to kind of get yeah. get going and it definitely assists a lot in that process again you don't have to become like a web developer <laughs> to make a documentation site which is nice yeah exactly so Barsa, i have these questions i like to ask everybody who comes on the show and mm-hmm. the first one is you know what's something that you're excited about that's happening in the world of python right now so for me there's this package called Scikit-Bio. Okay. It's coming up, and I think it's still not version one. I think it's, it could be a good help for all the Python users in our field because most of these tools exist in R, and it's really good to have that toolbox in, in Python as well because we have everything in Python, so it's just sometimes for these statistical tests, for example, we need to go to R. And it could be like the, the time that we need to spend to learn a new programming language could be something maybe more efficient. And I think that these packages help a lot. And and from what I see, a lot of the things that have been missing has been added to the Scikit-Bio package. And I'm really excited about it being released. Yeah, cool. What's something that you want to learn next? Again, this doesn't have to be programming. Yeah. Is there something that you're interested in learning? Yeah, so for me, maybe something that I don't have that much experience with and I'd like to learn uh, more about it is how to work on different parts of a project uh, in a team. Because mostly what I have been doing as a researcher has been working alone on my script. And of course, we use GitHub, but, but it's different when it comes to multiple people collaborating on the same project and the same open source project. And I think this is something that I really want to get into, to contribute to open source projects, at least the ones that are in our field. And I think I I can maybe positively contribute there. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I've had a couple of shows recently about sort of inroads and ways to kind of get involved. And I wonder if certain conferences might be a chance to be able to sit down with some other people and look at collaborating on it. That's great. (laughs) Yeah. You already got kind of a good resume going with with uh, what you're what you're working on. So, <laughs> so how can people follow the work that you do online? Anything related to the code, we usually publish the the code on GitHub. So my GitHub repository, I usually post them on my GitHub as well. So we have this GitHub page or account for our lab that 
that we use. Okay. And, and then all the projects are on that. But when it is published, I also post it on my own account as well. I pin it on my account. Okay. So that's how the new project, but also on LinkedIn and other social media and some of them I'm active, especially LinkedIn. I announce all the new projects there as well. Nice. I'll include all the links for all those repositories and your LinkedIn. Well, thanks, Parza. It's been really fantastic to talk to you about all this stuff. Thank you, Christopher. It was really fun to talk to you as well. I want to thank Parza Gadarmazi for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.